Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dorothy Kaplan Rothman, founding director of the Turnhour School of Music, and Anthony McGill, principal clarinet, the New York Philharmonic, uh, which has been around for 175 years. You're the first African-American principal performer at that extraordinary organization. Good to see both of you. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, the Turnhour School of Music is? A community music school. We're um, a member of the National Guild of Community Arts Education, and we welcome everyone to learn about music and have fun learning about music. What's your connection to this place? Well, Dorothy and I have some mutual friends, and uh, so she got in touch with me about um, doing a, a wonderful big gala for the program uh, just to support the kids and the, the community music program. And um, I grew up at one, and so I have a kind of affinity for that sort of sort of thing. And so I said yes. And so we've been We're working, preparing lucky. for this and big he event. Said yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because this guy's incredible. He is. <laughs> Some of your highlights of your most recent uh, work. Well, um, I kind of uh, I started off in the Cincinnati Symphony and the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. I was there for ten years, and. My recent uh, job with the New York Phil, of course, three years ago was a huge deal, basically a dream job for me for my entire life. And uh, one highlight, I guess, of my career would be appearing uh, with Yo-Yo Ma and others at uh, the inauguration of President Barack Obama. Oh, had you done that? Uh, I did the, the, <laughs> the inauguration. And we so, all knew that. Yeah, did I, did I reveal that? Uh, you didn't so, reveal anything. You yeah, think we didn't have yeah. that picture lined up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's How great kind of was cool. That? It was awesome. It was really great. Yeah. Yeah. What a picture, man. Yeah. What a day. So. Um, so, and you are from the south side of Chicago. South side of Chicago. Which makes yeah. you officially a, red, a White Sox fan. Yeah. I would say Red Sox. Isn't yeah. It? I <laughs> Don't do that. No. Um, talk about the importance of music in the lives of young people. Well, I think music uh, belongs in everybody's life. And uh, it's very natural. Uh, children are, are born singing and wanting to bang pots and pans, and music is just a part of them. And uh, I, I think that having the opportunity to start out in a place where you're getting the best instruction possible um, and experiencing music from many different points of view. At our school, we have classes for very young children, just exposing them. Uh, to the beginnings of melody and rhythm. And we have uh, a chorus. We're an affiliate of the Young People's Chorus of New York City, which was uh, founded by Francisco de Nunez. And um, we have chamber music and two orchestras and uh, theory and ear training classes mm. and lessons on all of the instruments. And um, I think it just... Uh, enriches your life and whether or not you decide mm. to become a professional musician is not what's important, but just the opportunity uh, to learn about music, enjoy music. Right. And there are many other <clears throat> byproducts as well. For example, learning how to think critically, how to um, work, with other hand, people. work with other people, how to handle yourself on a stage, how to feel relaxed in front of other people, right. how to communicate. Well, let me ask you this. For you, growing up where you did, in the environment that you did, what did music do for you? Music changed my life. Uh, you know, it, it gave me opportunity. Uh, it gave me a well-rounded education, of course. But it introduced me, you know, through my parents, it introduced me. <laughs> Look at that. That's great. What age? That's great. That was probably nine, ten, something like that. Um, you started playing when, by the way? I started when I was nine years old. Go ahead. So I was a beginner. And, uh, you know, it gave me a glimpse into a world that I, I could only imagine. You know, the world of downtown, north side, mm. um, the, where the kind of rich kids played. You know, this is not, this is not the neighborhood I grew up in. And... What it did is that it enabled me to broaden my horizons. It enabled me to fall in love with something that was outside of my immediate uh, neighborhood, to fall in love and see and see how I could reach greater heights. And basically, the world of possibility opened up for me, and I discovered, 
that um, I had this talent. I worked really hard at it, and um, it's uh, given me the life I have today. You know, got to it, sit here with you. Yeah, well, it's an honor to have both of you. But the question is, also, with so many cutbacks, government cutbacks, cutbacks in educational budgets, music, the teaching of music, the opportunity for young people to learn about music, it makes what you're doing that much more important, doesn't it? Absolutely. Tremendous responsibility. What message would you send to those who say, that's nice, but come on, how important could it be, you say? It's, it's an opportunity to um, learn another language, to uh, learn how to think, how to um, overcome obstacles. Uh, it's problem solving. Uh, it teaches you patience. Um, it doesn't happen right away. You learn that you need to put effort into things and you need to work hard to be able to do something well. And it's the pleasure of music as well, in, in addition mm -hmm. to all the other things. I mean, children, most people love music, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. So, so as there's talk of cutting uh, the NEA, National Endowment of the Arts, funding, mm -hmm. you think what? You know, arts make us human. They make mm -hmm. us um, more human. <clears throat> more. Culture is something that's extremely important for communication. It's an uh, international, international language. And you know, frankly, there's a lot of there's a lot of hate in the world, right? And when we explore the arts, especially given that opportunity as children and the amount of um, programs and dollars and and public um, support that the arts has in this country, to imagine getting rid of all of that, for as which is a small piece of the pie in the world, yeah. you know, this is a part of of the world that is is about love. It's about communication. It's about passion. Um, and and this, this tiny bit of funding that, to say from our government that, you know, we support that. We support people communicating with one another, people changing children's lives um, for the better. And, uh, you know, forget about entertainment. I think it's something, something deeper, something more real, something true. You, you know, Anthony, as I listen to you, I am not here to make a commercial for public broadcasting because we don't do commercials. But everything you just said could be said for those of us, not us, but the world of public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And for those who may not understand the contribution that public broadcasting makes to this country, particularly in the lives of young people. We thank you on behalf of everyone in public broadcasting. Thank both of you for the work you do every day for, for young people and introducing them to the world of music, which is so much more than just music. It's about learning about life. I want to thank both of you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Stay with us we'll be right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, Caldwell University, TD Bank, Qualcare Inc. Kessler Foundation, the North Ward Center, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area.